Welcome to the Ride of My Life podcast. I'm Caroline Rena, and here, let the ride inside adventure begin. I will share what it's like on my own healing journey, and through what I learn and become aware of, provide insight to your journey as well. Hey everyone, I'm Caroline Rena, and welcome to the Ride of My Life podcast and what a ride this has become. <laughs> um, and today I'm with Margot Dragon, who is actually, um, I'm going to go through her bio, but I met her through uh, her being an acupuncturist and I went to see her and we just started talking and I was like, oh, I want, to put, I want to do an interview with you. And she kindly agreed. And so here we are. And um, hey, Margo, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so Margo, she practices traditional Chinese medicine, Asian food therapy, NLP, which is neural linguistic programming for those of you who don't know what that is, and hypnosis in Concord. Did I pronounce that right? Concord, North Concord, Carolina. Concord, North Carolina. Yeah. I'm still new at this stuff. For over 10 years, she has firsthand experience working with cancer patients, as well as cooking for them across the country. In her practice, she focuses on the mind, body, and spirit connection to illnesses such as cancer to help the patients understand the deeper meaning to their disease. She has also participated in clinical research with Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Women's University while finishing her two masters in acupuncture and oriental medicine at the American College of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine in Houston, Texas. So again, thank you, Margo, for being here. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I know we can go deep and probably talk here for a few hours, but we don't have that much time. So yeah. 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 So um, all right. Well, I mean, really the first question I'd just love for you to share with everybody what it is that you do, the work that you do, um, easy. Well, um, I've been here in North Carolina for about 14 years. Um, and the practice has been open about that length of time. Um, in the practice, I see everything from a common cold up to stage four cancer. Wow. So um, I've had a variety of different types of patients from um, people that have cancers or chronic diseases or um, autoimmune diseases, um, previous COVID patients afterwards, um, sinus issues, headaches, menstrual issues, things like that, mm -hmm. um, and pain, of course. Yeah. Well, it's usually the first thing that gets somebody to be interested in calling you up, I'm sure, is pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but nobody, I mean, it's hard for a lot of people to recognize um, how, like, how pain kind of is created. And um, and a lot of it, and you just make sure I'm saying all, saying this right from, you know, your angle, because a lot of this is is my perception and my understanding through my own experience. So, sometimes the emotions and the, and the um, feelings and everything kind of like ruminate in our heads and our bodies start picking up on that and it, they land in the body somewhere as a disease or, or as pain or something. Um, and so what does that, what does that um, mean? Because you started to say you could, you, could, you could talk kind of about how traditional Chinese medicine works with. Um, There's a, there's a saying in ancient Chinese medicine that every disease starts with an unresolved emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I use the example of hitting somebody with a baseball bat. So if you hit somebody with a baseball bat, you're going to have, your body's going to react. You're going to have pain. You're going to have a cascading effect. You're going to have bleeding. You're going to have swelling, but emotionally, you're going to have an emotional reaction equal to the baseball bat hitting you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to say, ow, you hurt me. Why did you do that? You know, and all of these things are going to ruminate. Now, if you're not resolved in that emotion, it's going to ruminate and it's going to fester. Mm -hmm. And that causes us to change our behaviors, both 
um, physically and mentally. So if you are upset at somebody and you want something to soothe yourself with, you might pick a food that's actually going to contribute to a further disease, or it may contribute to that wound not healing correctly or not at all. And when you say like the wound, are you talking about the physical wound or the emotional? The wound? physical wound and the emotional wound. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Because they're sense. equal to each other. Okay. So the deeper the wound, whether it's cancer, the deeper the emotion. So they're they're equally the same. But when we look at Western medicine, especially in any kind of disease, they never take into consideration the emotional part of any physical disease. Chinese right. medicine does that. Right. And that's why I've always been interested in sticking to that or reaching out when I need, you know, when I feel like I need it, because, you know, what I normally talk about is like trauma, because I've been through trauma as a child, different levels of it, starting from in utero on up, um, yeah. emotional, mental trauma, not really physical trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but I know how much that has affected me. And so, and I also know how the body works from my own experiences and doing massage therapy and, you know, learning different things like that. And it's like, it, it, I've always loved to have these conversations because I want to learn more, but I also, in this case, I want to share that. So that's why we're, we're doing yeah. this. And you have this fantastic, um, you know, process when you do the acupuncture because, I, I don't know what it was, but there was just something for me that just started coming out and rising up in me and um, emotionally. And weirdly, that's never happened before when I've had an acupuncture appointment. So I really feel like there's more to you <laughs> than, than meets the eye here. And that's, that's um, it, there's just something that just, like I cried during the appointment, during the session. And I'm like, what's, Okay, I don't know. I'm, and I understand why, what it does for me, why it happens with, yeah. for me, but why would that happen? Can you explain to people for them because, why that would happen? Because when you're tapping into um, the body with the needles, the needles run through channels in the body that run up into the organs. And mm -hmm. all, of those organ, all of those organs have an emotion attached to it. So crying is actually related to the liver in Chinese medicine, which is anger, fear or frust or anger, frustration or worry. Right. Okay. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense because at that time when I came to see you, I was going through, I was bringing up, bringing out this deep anger from, and you know all about this because I just read this in your book, by the way, Oops, I have to share it. I don't know. Can you see? No, I can't see it. What, do you have your book with you? You can poke. Put it up. No, you know what? I don't there. have it. With, there, there's part there it of it. Is. Okay. Yeah. And, ah, love these backgrounds. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, anger. So um, one of the things that I, I just read in your book was about parentification. Yeah. I was parentified by my mother and there's a lot of other things that went on in that. And I was going through this process over that period of time just after I saw you. Yeah. And then um, worked with some, did some EMDR work and it pulled, it just pulled all that anger up and it showed me the connections and my relationships and, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, yeah. yeah. So it, this is some powerful work, you know, and I'm curious though, um, from your, from your uh, story, your own story, how did mm -hmm. you get into this work? What is that, what is that thing that, you know, the, the story, um, you can be as vulnerable as you feel comfortable being, you know. Oh, about. how I got into Chinese medicine? Well, yeah, and your story, your past story that kind of, oh. that you healed from along with that, you know. Well, I um, had always been a curious kid and always wondered why for things. Why this? Why that? Why does this happen? And so... <laughs> <clears throat> there was a lot of turmoil in my childhood yeah. and, you know, I wanted to understand it. And when I had, I always been fascinated with medicine mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to go to um, medical school and become a cardiologist, but I turned it down because I felt that it wasn't right for me. And I wanted to be able to cure people. You know, that was my fantasy at the time to cure people. 
Um, and I felt that uh, Western medicine being a cardiologist was not going to do the, the job. So um, when I was in undergrad, one of the girls was going, well, I'm going to Chinese medical school. And I'm like, what is that? <clears throat> so I did some research and I found one of the best schools in the country was in Houston. And, you know, just out of dumb luck and, you know, I just applied and got in. Um, it was uh, 3,000 hours and four board exams. It was a long haul. Um, I spent uh, five years there in Texas. Wow. wow. But um, as far as the book, the book was um, something that I had thought about a long time ago because um, my very first breast cancer patient was, um, you know, she had breast cancer. And I'm like, well, why, you know? Um, and she had actually had it three times. And so I was like, okay, there's got to be some rhyme or reason behind this whole thing. And, um, you know, thank goodness she thought it was absolutely crazy, but she listened to me and she actually went to the Cushy Institute up in Beckett, Massachusetts, which at the time it's not open anymore, but, um, it's uh, macrobiotics, which is um, a Japanese food therapy, and it's quite effective. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I read Michio Kushi's book, The Cancer Prevention Diet Book, and that's what I was using for my cancer patients when I was cooking for them. But, you know, when I was cooking for them, you can get their blood work better, their bone work better, or their urine better. But then when you leave, they go downhill and die. So I was like, okay, what is up with this? What is happening? And so um, the other thing that I noticed when I was cooking for these cancer patients was um, the isolation that the cancer patients actually had because I was cooking for them, but no other family members were either learning how to cook or cooking with them or eating with them. Mm. You know, I would make brown rice and miso soup and some vegetables and things like that. And they would eat their steak, you know, so yeah. um, there's a lot of isolation in that process. So the reason why I wrote the book was I had to look at the emotional component behind these cancers because nobody was addressing them in Western medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are several books out there that talk about um, why we don't get better. Um, but I wanted it directly linked to the cancer and how we, we grow these cancers over time because we have not resolved certain things in our lives that now have driven us in the direction of forming these cancers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that was, you know, because I have used my story on my own background for so many years with my patients I put my story in the book, even though I don't have breast cancer and nobody in my family has breast cancer, but I wanted to share my traumas that I went through and what I had to do to heal, to get to that place and to get to a deeper understanding of my own self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's why I put, you know, I call the ugly bits of myself. You know, if you don't own those little ugly bits of yourself, then how do you expect to heal from it if you don't take ownership of it? And one of the hardest things was um, uh, getting over my own abortion when I was 19 years old. Wow. Um, I had blamed, it was my boyfriend at the time turned into my husband, but he was the one who made the decision and there was no delay in it or anything like that. And because I came from an abusive background, I was very compliant. So there was no object, you know, objecting to it or anything like that. But in the back of my mind, I sat there and I said, okay, I can kill my child and be with this man who loves me, what I thought, mm -hmm. or I could try to go home a thousand miles away. I was unwed, didn't have a car, try to get back home to my mother, but then my abusive sister was there mm. and she was older than me. And I thought in the back of my mind, she's going to take my child away from me. And then I'm going to have to deal with her. Wow. So the lesser of the evils in my mind 
at that time was to just have an abortion. And when you're that young, though, you don't know. You can't. You don't know anything. You don't know anything, right? You don't can't pick yeah. hazard. And then when someone tells you that you need to do something, you're like, because you don't know, you're like, oh, sure, okay, you know, and. Yeah, and there was, you know, I grew up in a very small town in New England, um, and I was not exposed to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And like I, you know, I was telling you, my mom was 44 years older than I was. She was born in 1920. So, okay. you know, you really didn't talk about gynecology or anything like that. She had never taken me to the gynecologist. And then my friend took me to the gynecologist and he looked like Orville Redenbacher with the bow tie and everything. And he was so angry at me for being pregnant. He threw the card to another gynecologist to give me an abortion. And so I had to deal with that. And then I had to deal with the humiliation of going, you know, basically on my own because my my husband or my boyfriend at the time just dropped me off at the door, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to scrape up the money for the abortion, drop me off at the door, so to speak, um, and pick me up, you know, a couple hours later and it was done. But the traumatic thing for me was at the time, um, I saw the container with my name on it. And I knew my baby was going in that container. Mm -hmm. And so I had to deal with those harsh realities, but I stuffed all those emotions and spent the majority of my marriage actually being very angry at my husband. And he never talked about anything, um, any deep subjects whatsoever. It was, you know, sports, work, cars, and that was about it. And we never had a deep conversation about anything because he had his own trauma growing up and doesn't want to talk about anything real so there wasn't there was two kids trying to have a marriage there weren't a two there weren't two adult adults having a marriage yeah so I had to face those those things in my own life and I had to say you know what this is not healthy for either one of us and we need to look at it from a realistic standpoint. And, you know, I left him eight, oh gosh, almost 20 years now. I left him to go off to grad school and I never went back because I knew it would have killed either one of us. It would be so unhealthy for us to try to exist together that it just, it couldn't possibly work. Because mm -hmm. you had two people that did, weren't acknowledging that they needed to work on themselves. How long did it take you before you started to recognize that you needed to do that? Um, there were certain circumstances that were going on that I felt like my needs, I was not good at expressing needs mm -hmm. or wants because I felt that I never deserved them. So, you know, I couldn't even get him to sit on the sofa with me. I couldn't, he didn't even want to have sex with me. So there were things like that. There were deep, deep problems for both of us mm -hmm. for a long time. And I just, you know, played house basically and ignored what I could ignore. But when I was 29, um, I had a bad car accident mm -hmm. and somebody hit me from behind. And that's when I started to look at the laws of physics because the, the universe was saying, you are holding yourself back and you need to go forward in your life. And that car accident pushed me out of my marriage and into grad school. Mm -hmm. And so I look at the physics of things, the laws of nature and physics. And, you know, I don't look at the, I'm not a counselor. So I don't look at the, well, how did that make you feel? And what did you think about that? I don't do that. I just look at the disease and I know the emotion that's tied to the disease and I say, okay, these are the emotions that are tied to this disease. You know, for everybody that has back pain in Chinese medicine, the urinary bladder channel goes down the back mm -hmm. and also your, your skeleton, your bones. And both of those are interconnected with kidney and urinary bladder and the emotion fear. Mm -hmm. So you literally, you literally have a fear of being emotionally or physically supported. Okay. And that's when your back hurts. 
Which is, which is interesting because as I explained when I went to come see you, I was going through this process of, of um, just coming out of, uh, or, or finding out about anger and, and learning about parentification with my mother and how that related to all these things. And I came to see you for my upper back hurting. And I couldn't figure out what that was. And now you're kind of piecing all this stuff together. So I'm only sharing mine so you can kind of elaborate on that. A lot of us, a lot of people have back problems. And I don't think, and it feels to me like not a lot of people feel supported. I, in that case, have had, um, in fact, you even worked on the kidney meridian for me. Yeah. Um, because of fear. And mm -hmm. um, so there's all this stuff going on. And I just, I, I ended up going, I don't think I reached out to you after, but I ended up going to see that chiropractor that you recommended. Yeah. And um, he... When I, re I reminded myself when I started, uh, before I went in there with him, oh, when I was younger, I was diagnosed with, with uh, scoliosis, like a very, a very yeah. um, not bad case of it, just enough. Mm -hmm. And it's like, then I started looking up the reasons behind, I went into Louise Hay and, you know, try to find out the reasons behind the scoliosis and, behind, and it all started, pieces all started connecting with what you do, with what he does, with the fear, with the anger, with this, with that, all this stuff just starts coming into play. And I'm like, I'm, I'm using an affirmation now. <laughs> I stand tall, you know, you know, and I'm free in my life and this, and I literally, when I walk down the road right now, this was how long I saw you probably about a uh, three weeks ago or a month ago. Yeah. I feel taller. I mm -hmm. feel taller. It doesn't mean I am, but I feel taller, you know, yeah. like things are working, but there's still stuff coming out. So the back is important for, yeah. I think for a lot of people, because I haven't, I've never felt supported. Yeah. You know, I've always had to support everybody else. Like my, like I had to make sure my mother was okay because she, you know, when I was little, she called me on the phone. I think I was like four years old. She called me on the phones and, um, I read this in court paperwork, obviously, I don't have a, a true memory of this, but um, she said, why haven't you called me to tell me you love me and ask me how my health is? And then she would always end it with, after all, I bore you. So I always had this guilt in addition sure. <laughs> to it. So I've never been supported by mother and having guilt for not being supported by my own mother, you know, so it's always, this has been consistent in my life. So your mother herself didn't have support. I, she yes. Learned it. Yes. And I, and I know a lot of her story. I don't know all of it, but a lot of it yeah. is also uh, um, second generation Holocaust survivor. So there's like a lot of PTSD in there and, you know, try, and she was four when all that started. So yeah it's all been in there. So I've been, I know I've been carrying a lot of her shame and anger and fear and whatever. And I've been doing a lot of grief work to release that too, not just my own, but that. So um, now for whatever reason, I want to ask you this before we go into this process that, that um, I'd like for, that I, that I'd like for you to do with me um, that you explained <laughs> um, for whatever reason, over the last couple of years, like I've never personally in my own family experienced cancer or anyone who has had it. Ours is all heartbroken, heart issues yeah. from, from, from Eastern Bloc, you know, World War II, yeah. all that, all that, all that kind of yeah. thing. So Losing like, families, broken hearts. Yeah. Yeah. So heart attacks and, you know, and blood, blood, um, uh, blood issues. related issues. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now my experience was, and I do want you to go, I really want to hear about this. How, I know you talk about it in your book, how the, the last couple of years has been all about grief because of, of a friend died from uh, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of story around it. I'm not going to get into it, but I do know her enough Um to know that why that happened, but I'd like to hear from your perspective and from like some of the stuff that you shared in the book, some other reasons to include the food, to include all that stuff. Can you, can you give a little bit of a um, explanation on that whole thing with the breast cancer and well, you know, so many women getting it now, you know, and it's really, yeah. Well, what I, what I did originally was um, 
the the title of the book is the silent suicide the link between ptsd addiction and breast cancer and the reason why i picked that title was um your very first addiction in life is breast milk mm -hmm. and addictions are also necessary for us to survive so when we're children we need our parents no matter what or somebody a parent figure to raise us until at least 15 for our own survival. And the breast milk has tryptophan in it, which is a sedative and sugars in it, lactose, that work like cocaine on the brain. So it activates the dopamine receptors. That's why when you see a baby breastfeed, they conk out. Mm -hmm. Or if you try to uh, wean them off the breast, you see them basically go through withdrawals just like an addict would, because that's how strong the chemical bond is. Yeah, yeah. But your mother-child bond is the strongest bond you'll ever have in your life. I always joke, if you could have sex and a baby bottle at the same time, you would have the mother-child <laughs> intimacy with the, with the nourishment, yeah. you know, because it's tone, touch, taste, nourishment. So that's the strongest bond you'll ever have in your life. And so when you look at these women, there's some kind of emotional disconnect with their mothers that they have, you know, secretly craved that, that connective bond with their mothers and were never able to get it back. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in the book, I gave a lot of examples of um, different types of celebrities that have breast cancer. So like um, if you look at Shannon Doherty from 90210, mm -hmm. um, Shannon, was start, Shannon started acting when she was 10 years old. When she was 12, her mother almost died. Mm -hmm. And then she was, um, her mother went back to work and then her father got very ill. And so she, by the age of 18, was the sole income provider for her family. So she ended up parenting her, her parents monetarily. Mm. And so she even said that's a tough burden at the age of 18 well, also Shirley Temple had the same thing happen to her at the age of five. Mm. She was the sole income provider for her, not only for her parents, but her contract with Fox Studios actually saved them from going bankrupt. Wow. So they took her and isolated her from everybody all the other children because they didn't want her being influenced by anyone. And they both had breast cancer. Wow. So when you start looking at people's stories in that way, then you can start to see, oh, you know, maybe I went through that or maybe I saw some of that. So you can start to identify where you pick up these patterns. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these women, you know, will eat yogurt in the morning or they'll have ice cream to soothe themselves or, you know, some, I've had, uh, I've had estrogen driven breast cancer patients that say, I cannot give up milk. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my patients, I would catch her in the grocery store and she'd have ice cream and she'd have milk and things like that. And, you know, she's since passed, but she had tremendous problems with her mother and their relationship. Um, and it's not a question of whether they love their mothers or not. Um, that's not even the issue. Um, the issue is the relationship itself. You know, I have, I have mothers, I've had cancer patients that have been beaten by their mothers as children and I listen to them talk to them on the phone as adults and they go, I love you, mom. Mm -hmm. Because that inner child still does not want to jeopardize or break that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the things I read in one of the books that I was um, you know, reading while I was creating my own book, um, they said that you know, a kid could go to the emergency room and be burned and have these horrendous burns and they're saying, I want my mommy, I want my mommy. 
and it was the mother that burned them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or there are stories of adoptive children that will cry and scream saying they want their mothers. Meanwhile, they're sitting on their adoptive mother's laps. You know, I'm glad you're bringing this up because last the last uh, uh, interview I had was with someone who does um, grief work. And um, where I'm coming from, the, re the, the thing that projected me into doing this this uh, interview series with people and the work that I do is from a thing called I don't uh, parental alienation. Uh huh. And um, you know, for for those of you who don't know what that is, a, a real quick description is like the child is either lied to or they don't get told the whole truth about the other parent. And generally, the parent that they're not getting told the truth about loves that child and wants to be with them. But it's such a um, consistent. Uh, like brainwashing situation where the child ends up pushing that other parent out of their life. And that's not normal. And so we were talking about what it's like, cause I, that happened with, with me and my kids and I couldn't figure out how to grieve my kids. So that's where that conversation came up, but yeah. this is rampant. You know, this is what I do know. I, I was actually in a documentary uh, called um, racing family and they talk about how how rampant this is in this country. It's like 25 million uh, parents are going through it, double yeah. amount for the kids that are going through it. I mean, we're yeah. like setting ourselves up for all these diseases and stuff like that based off of the, the way that our society takes thing that does things now. And and I actually started a group called Glimmers of Hope. And um, the first group was for the mothers. So there's like, I don't even, there's over 500 mothers in that group. And these are mothers that want to be with their children, just like the other group I have of the fathers and, you know, whatever. So yeah. to me, what I'm seeing also is that, and women aren't the only ones getting breast cancer. So it's like, how prevalent is this trauma in embedded in our, in our society yeah, and it's causing breast cancer and especially to start coming out in men, you know, I mean, because men have some men have issues with their moms too, the mother wound. Oh, yeah. Whatever you want to call yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. I put I put one um, male in the book. Um, and I Peter Chris was his name and he um, was with the group Kiss. Oh, OK. But he had a very close bond with his mother to the point that they slept together in the same bed. Mm -hmm. So there was some trauma in there. And I, I, I saw an interview with him, you know, when he was later in life and they asked him what he was doing. And he says, oh, I'm just drinking some I'm just eating some milk and cookies, you know, and here's this grown man. And you think you know, milk and cookies is something a little child would eat. Mm -hmm. You know, why do you need to nourish yourself with that? And he's had breast cancer, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. I don't know all of his story. He did write a book, um, you know, but, um, you know, whatever you can get out of some of these stories you look at, you know? And some of the famous people are just easier to do like Betty Davis had breast cancer. She had a horrendous uh, relationship with her mother. And then when her sister came along, her sister wasn't even acknowledged by her mother. Wow. You know, so, and, you know, they always said, you know, Betty was hard, hard to get along with. She was hard to work with. She was very difficult. And, you know, then her mother would dote on her the whole time, but then turn around and backstab her. And uh, there was a story in there that her mother had a birthday party and Betty actually showed up in a maid's outfit. You mean like a seductive maid's outfit or a maid? No, just like a maid's outfit, okay. ma <laughs> meaning, meaning she was the one who served her mother. Got it. Oh, wow. That's and it was never her serving her yes. child. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and that's the thing, that's one of the things I'm looking at right now is this whole mother wound thing, because especially with mothers and daughters, but I'm, I am definitely seeing it with mothers and sons. It's all over the place. It's like the, yeah. the diminishment of the, of the feminine, the divine feminine in the world or whatever, because of the um, toxic male, you know, stuff that's going on. It's like, we're, we're trying to come that's, out of that, right? That's why I'm reading this book. Oh, I've seen that before. 
This, this book was written by Logan Cohen. He's actually a therapist in Charlotte. Okay. But he's talking about how men are raised in these male myths. And, you know, men, the only, you know, acceptable emotion is anger. You can be yes. a little bit happy, but you can't be a lot happy. The you certainly scarcity, can't be sad. No. Yeah, scarcity mentality. There can only be number one, you know. And so it, it taught, it, it causes men not to be in balance emotionally with themselves. And so men end up in conflict with themselves and they're going to be in conflict with everybody else because they haven't found their emotional balance. Right. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of work we need to do. <laughs> well, I think, I think the biggest thing for us to do as an adult is recognize that our parents struggled and that they're human and they had their un, their unresolved trauma. Yeah. Because once, once you start to see it and you see the pattern, then you could go, okay. Like one of the things that I realized was um, I was very attracted to men that had totalitarian fathers. Um, I was attracted, my dad was in World War II. Um, he was a captain in the army, so he gave orders. My husband's dad was a Navy fighter pilot and he gave orders. My friend was, an, his father was a NASCAR driver and he gave orders. They didn't give emotions. Mm -hmm. They didn't give, you know, cuddles and things like that or hugs or whatever. They were like, this is how it is. This is what you need to do. Don't show your emotions, all of these things. So it's, it's ruining this whole generation of men. Mm -hmm. And then they try to have relationships with women and it doesn't work, you know? Yeah, and there's an extension to that too because my father and a lot of family members were in the military, in the army, and he was like that. He gave orders, he was in control, he had to, you know, whatever. I'm a very sensitive child and I want my daddy to be proud of me. So guess what I did? I joined the army and I was a captain in the army before I got out. And then when I, in that process of joining the army myself, I lost uh, moments of, or, or learned how to stop being emotional. Although I'm an emotion or I, I express my emotions, but they're not necessarily, I also pick up on other people's emotions. So I can't tell the difference, but it's like, I, I feel that when you say it, because that's what happened. It feels like that's what happened with me because of. Well, when we're it. empathetic, we pick up narcissistic people. Okay. Thank you. And that's what we get stuck in that loophole. Yeah. And so, or we pick up people that are misogynistic that hate women. You know, so, because, because the, the mother never protected the child from the father. And so they start to secretly hate their own mothers mm. because it's like, you dragged me through this. This is your issue. Uh, my, my husband himself will tell peop people that his mother is dead and she's not dead. Wow. I mean, you know? and this, this is so crazy because it's like this underlying pattern theme that's running through the, the world, you know, that it, it's just, it's showing up in so many different places, but it's, it's all here. It's in like in the subconscious of, of the masses, basically. Yeah. Well, we're having a, we're having a cosmic shift anyhow, because we're yeah. going into the, 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 the hundred years of feminine power. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing these men do this last ditch totalitarian effort to keep, tr you know, keep hold of whatever they can keep hold of, but it's starting to fail and it's starting to backfire on them. I mean, the war, unfortunately, in Ukraine is a great example of society says, you know what, we're not tolerating war anymore. And we're going to make sure that you don't have the dollars for the war, or we're going to, you know, change these things so we can get rid of more and more of this stuff so we don't deal with it. Because the women are so focused on um, raising the family and nurturing the family. And then we have these totalitarian men that go, well, I want the piece of property. I don't care who's on it. I'm going to annihilate them. 
-hmm. You know, so women are going, why are we even having children when we can't even raise them in a safe place? And here's these crazy guys that turn around and destroy it anyhow. Yeah. We have another generation. And, you know, it's interesting because I read um, a story. uh, This woman did some research on um, Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler was Jewish. His mother was Jewish, okay? But his father was a totalitarian and was very abusive to Adolf. So Adolf appeased the 15, 16, 17-year-old, 18-year-old rebellious self, which was his army, but also he was trying to annihilate his Jewish heritage at the same time. Well, guess what? Putin's family went through a lot of stuff in Germany with the Germans. And so he goes into Ukraine trying to get rid of the neo-Nazis. So is he relapsing back to the trauma that his grandfather and his father and those people whack? actually went through in World War II. Wow. That's, that's a, a, I'm big on perspectives. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective to look at, to come from with that. You know, and the only reason why I say that is because when I've been dealing with all these cancer patients, they end up marrying somebody who is the representative of the parent they have unresolved issues with. Mm-hmm. So they go back to the scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I called the book The Silent Suicide is because what if their inner child wants to get out of that relationship and the only way that inner child sees the way out is to transition or die? Mm. Wow. Because we're creating the illness ourselves. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's why I looked at it because, you know, my father was a captain in the army during World War II. He served four years in the South Pacific. And when I was um, about to turn six, my father had killed himself. So I had looked, you know, my, my father probably had unresolved PTSD. Mm-hmm. And at the time in the 70s, the early 70s, the drugs weren't that good. Mm-hmm. My father was um, severely depressed and was an alcoholic and under psychiatric care. And he still killed himself. And I remember my mom telling me that the psychiatrist actually sent my mother a bill after my father had killed himself. Well, those and those times back then during the 70s, like psychiatry and therapy, psychotherapy were way different than they are now too they they didn't understand a lot of stuff the way we do now so yeah yeah that, that's off what if i don't and i had to deal with my mom being a manic depressive mm-hmm. and and when she was when i was in high school she was on lithium melaryl and vivactyl at the same time and the doctor only monitored her blood once a year Ugh, wow so my mother would get lithium toxic mm-hmm So she would scream my name out the front door at one o'clock in the morning, or she would read Helter Skelter and tell, uh, call the police and tell the police that Charles Manson was coming to kill her. Mm -hmm. And so I had to deal with that. And then I had to deal with my sister and her trauma that was unresolved. And I was basically, you know, her direction of outlet of anger was towards me. And this was your old, was this your older sister? Yeah, she's six years older than I am. And the, isn't that kind of um, n- normal for the older child to feel like that or when another child comes into? Um... Well, my sister, it's interesting because my parents had two boys and then she, they had my sister who was the princess of the family. Mm. And so yeah. um, she had her brothers and her for her and her mom to herself for six years. And then my mom get pregnant again. Well, one month before um, I was born, while my mother was eight or nine months pregnant, 
she and my father decided to put my eldest brother, Dave, into a state mental institution, and he was a highly functional autistic. So back in the 60s, what happened was you sign over parental rights to your child. Yeah. So you could never get your child back. Wow. And she well, did that while she was eight months pregnant with me. So you got all that emotion and everything that was going on. Yeah. And I found that out under hypnosis because mm -hmm. um, he asked me to tap into my mother's emotions. And I said, she's torn. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, you know, she was torn. And so what ended up happening was um, my brother was placed March 1st. My, um, I was born April 5th, one month later. And my mother had promised my sister to take her to Howard Johnson's for her sixth birthday. And she was born on April 14th. So my mom was probably still in the hospital with me back then. So her whole family dynamic when I was born changed. Mm -hmm. Two years later, her parents split apart. Four years later, her father kills himself. Wow. Wow. So, you know, a that trauma. was a lot. That was yeah. a lot of trauma for her. And so, you know, I had to look back because I would sit there and go, well, what did I do? What did I do wrong? You know, um, and, and, you know, she would, she would tell me, well, what are you doing? You're wasting mom's money. You don't need that. You know, where are you yeah. going? I mean, she was constantly on me, you know, not realizing, you know, she had some passive aggressive and some narcissistic behaviors that, you know, I saw then. And, you know, later on down the road, when I was an adult and I was working in South Florida, I went to go see a friend of hers that knew me as a child. And we spent four hours together. And he said to me, he goes, you know, I really didn't think you'd come out as normal as you did. Wow. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, everybody in your family just, yeah, you, you were meant to be in this family so you can do the work that you're doing. <laughs> Yeah. And I, you know, I realize that, you know, and I don't look at it in a negative situation. Um, you can't get to compassion unless you go through all of that, you know, and mm -hmm. there's one mother Teresa, one Jesus, one Dalai Lama, right. and they had to let go of their anger and see the truth yeah. for what it yeah. was. And to realize that you can treat people with compassion. You're not there to fix them. You're not there almost to even support them, but just acknowledge where they're at mm -hmm. and not and not love them conditionally for where you want them to fill the gaps within your own life. And that's what we do. We pour yes. ourselves into other people and abandon ourselves because we believe we're going to get that mother-child bond within all of these intimate relationships with people, but we've lost ourselves in the process. Yes. I can vouch. Yeah. And, and it's just doing the work and healing and walking through all that and finding that self-love inside because it's in there. You know, I mean, we search everywhere. I searched, I searched in different religions. I searched in different, um, you know, gurus and, and um, different books and all these things. And I'm like, oh, ooh, ooh, I'm going to find the answer out there. And then I don't remember exactly the turning point, but there was a one point where it was like, okay, this isn't out there. It's and then I start looking here and I'm like, oh, now I'm going to take responsibility for everything that happened because yeah. I'm the one who's been projecting this energy and because of everything that happened with me and maybe now I need to clear that energy and release or heal or whatever that, you know, whatever that was. And the big deal is that we all have love inside of ourselves. We just, because of all the trauma, I feel like we don't know it's there. I mean, it's so far away well, the interesting thing for me is, you know, I've seen a lot of people die and I don't call it death. I call it transition. We're light beings having a human experience. We're of love and light. If you're yes. religious, we're of God. Yes. Um, but we forget that it's almost like the, the, the ship we travel through time and space is the body. But when we pollute it, and we pollute it with unhealthy foods and unhealthy people and unhealthy thoughts, we cannot see our connection to our higher self. Yes. And so we go into this self-pity party 
I call it the five element pity party. And we go, oh, why doesn't somebody love us? Why doesn't somebody need us? Blah, 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 blah. But the reality is you don't want yourself. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's the self-hatred, the, everything that we learn, we turn in on ourselves first. And isn't that another reason why we get sick? Why people get sick? Because we're turning yeah, on because, that anger. And, because and somehow we think there's a, a lottery ticket out there with our name on it. And we're just, you know, going to find it any time now. And that's going to change our whole life. You know, my husband was one, he's a fantasy type of person. He sits there and fantasizes about everything and does nothing. Um, only when he's at home, when he's at work, he's a great worker, but he would always tell me while, while I was living there, he said, when we win the lotto, things would change. And I said, yeah, you, the ticket and the dog are out of here. Because he never, ever realized that he had the lottery. He had the winnings, but he never had the gratitude to see everything that he's had in his life. And he was always focused on what he never had in his life. Mm. And that may be part of the reason, you know, his father died of cancer at the age of 35. So he lost his, you know, his, he was 13, almost 14 when his father died. And so his family dynamic changed. So in essence, when I went from my home, from my manic depressive mother and my basic narcissistic sister, I met my husband who was basically a manic depressive and narcissistic. So I kept that pattern going for myself yep. until the universe sent me a car accident or, you know, blocked me from returning back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and returning back to these doors, you know? I have a friend of mine. I care about him very much. He is very, he's very, he's struggling. And I would go and drive to where he works because he owns his company. And I would get this nauseous pit in my stomach. Like you don't belong there. You know, I was fine when I was there, but it was like, there was something, you know, off. And so I don't go anymore. Mm, because mm -hmm. it's it's like your your body's intuition is going to tell you the right things but we dismiss it as it oh that can't possibly be you know well and part of it is because what we know we're going to also attract that type of person or whatever into our life because of our past experience um mine is narcissist i've attracted narcissists into my life before and you know, recognizing now that with all these changes that you were talking about going on, there's a lot of people being pulled out of my life for various reasons. And I don't like it. Yeah. But I also know that it's supposed to happen, you know, because my own fear of being alone and my own fear of, you know, isolation and all that. And yet still all these people, but these are the people that really never loved me for me to begin with. That's what I'm talking about. Well, they never love themselves. Well, right. And I, yeah, I was, I was, but for me, from my perspective of this, they didn't love me. I could not get what I needed from them. You know, the whole external thing. Yeah. And um, that's another piece where it started. I started to see it's, yeah, maybe it's not them because this is showing, what is that saying? Wherever you, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so like every relationship every experience everything is coming from me and it's like what's happening here so just yeah like, and it's funny because now I'm interacting with more people that have been in relationships with narcissists mm -hmm. and we both you know we all share the same story mm -hmm. we're very passionate very loving people very tender people mm -hmm. and so it's interesting you know and they and they warn you like psychiatrists or psychologists warn you boring is normal and so when we don't have that trauma going on it when we have basically non-eventful things like it it goes easy it goes smooth you know there's no problems, you know, you can have an adult conversation, yeah. your inner child's going, wait a minute, this is I wrong. want my fix, I right. want my fix of, of chaos, I want that fix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you have to be very careful yeah. that what you see is boring is really not boring, but normal. Yeah, wow.
and to allow yourself to get used to what we think is boring. Well, I mean, everything in life, though, is like run under fear, like all these movies that come out about, you know, oh, these fear, fear based movies and these fear based, all this stuff coming like the, it, it brings our adrenaline up to the point where like, I don't even you, you tell you tell us like our bodies can't handle that much adrenaline constantly. And that's what we're living in right now. And that's well, I have, definitely far from boring. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have not had a television in um, probably 17 years now. Oh, wow. Longer than me. Yeah. I don't have one. Either. Yeah. Um, I, I look at it this way and I tell my patients because a lot of the times I ask them, you know, what do you eat? And they're like, oh, I don't have time. And I go, oh, well, you know, um, did you watch Dancing with Stars? And they're like, oh, yeah. And I said, how long's that? And they're going, oh, it's an hour. I go, then you have plenty of time to cook. I said, because nobody in that box is going to come and rescue you. Nobody mm -hmm. in that box wants to be in charge of you. So, you know, I tell people, get rid of the television for a month, two months, disconnect it, you know? And see where you're at in a month, because we spend so much time disengaging in our own lives that mm -hmm. we're not living it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, spend time going outside, spend yeah. time, you know, by the water and things like that. Spend time with nature's elements, you know, um, plants, whatever, grow, grow your food, things like that. Things that give you value and meaning. Those are the things that you need to put emphasis on in your life every single day. I'm thinking I needed to hear that. I don't watch TV. I watch Hulu. And there are certain shows on there that are really good shows, you know, but there are also shows that you have to catch up on four years. of. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Instead of, and then I overwhelm, what I do is I, I binge watch every day and I haven't yeah. done that in a while. And then... I realized I finally got to the end of this one show I've been watching, which is really a good show. It's called A Million Little Things. Uh huh. And and I binge watch it. I'm at the very end. I'm waiting for the next one to come out next week, like old school, where we had to wait a week before we could watch something. Yeah. And I recognize I'm like, oh, I have time to do that thing I wanted to do today, whatever that was. I can't remember. Yeah. I thought about that this yeah. morning, and I'm like, oh. And then I'm like, no, but I want to see it. So that's an addiction too to distract. Well, I mean, women, unfortunately, are set up um, in a lose-lose situation because we start with, you know, Disney and, and you know, Ugh. you know, princesses and princes and things like that. Knights in shining armor. <laughs> Knights in shining armor, you know. It's okay if you eat the poison apple because the love of your life is going to fix it for you. Ah. So... Uh -huh. You know, we've, we've, we've set society up to fail. So why would we expect them to do well? Mm -hmm. you know? Even our medical system, our Western medical system is designed to keep you sick, mm -hmm. not to keep mm -hmm. you healthy. In ancient China, the Chinese medical doctors were not paid unless their patients were healthy. I heard that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So when I started my business, I started it with the philosophy that I wanted to go out of business. And my philosophy is if I don't do my job right, then you're going to have to come back and need me. But if I do my job right, you're not going to need me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. of course, you know, there's always going to be people that are, you know, come in and stuff, but I wanted to be able to give people as much information as possible in their healing and so the book ended up being basically my lecture, even though it was focused on not only on breast cancer, it's basically, you know, most of my lecture that I give my patients. Yeah, I like, I really, I, I appreciate you saying this um, out loud because I, I actually went to nursing school for like almost the entire time that I was to get my, my nursing degree up in, or up. Where am I? Yeah, up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and um, at one point, there was just something that kept stopping me. And I didn't know, like during class, I could not remember the formula to give medication. It wasn't meant for me to remember that because I don't really agree with medication unless of yeah. course for an emergency situation. So that was like a turning point in my life. And 
when I started I, one day, the nurse during clinicals, she's, she's like, well, so what's the formula? And I, and I went blank. I totally went blank. And I went through this whole process where my entire life changed. And she's like, let's go talk and let's make a decision and all this. And after on my way home, I'm like crying because I've spent all this time waiting and struggling and working so hard to get this degree. And this is how, this is how it stops. And I was like, interestingly enough, a couple of days prior, I was looking online at massage therapy schools and I'm like, as I'm driving home, bawling and crying, I'm like, oh, well, you need to go back and look at the massage therapy school. And the, and when I left, the nurse had said, well, make sure you call me and let me know what you wanted or come back tomorrow and we'll figure out what to do. That's what she said. I didn't even yeah. wait until the next day. I called her up that night after driving home and bawling and crying and saying, oh my God, I just went through two years worth of this. Six credits left. I couldn't take it anymore because I didn't want to be that kind of nurse. Yeah. So I ended up leaving um, nursing school and going to massage therapy school. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. But it also taught me that what most of us have been taught was to give up our own responsibility for our own health and not to take that. And, and we're trusting this, this medical, you know, system to tell us what to do. And, and we can't even trust our own instincts and our own, um, you know, inner, inner voice to tell us what we need. I mean, literally now I've been taught kinesiology, I, I do this little thing where it's like, oh, well, is this good to take it, you know, or whatever. And then I do, or I hold something. I can't do this one, obviously. Muscle testing. Yeah. 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 So now I talk to myself and I'm like, this doesn't feel right. Okay. I'm not doing it. And, and it's yeah. giving me answers and some of the answers I don't want to hear, but I yeah. kind of have to follow them. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. But when I was, responsibility. when I was in, uh, when I was in hypnosis school, um, I learned how to use one of these. Oh, I have, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and it, it was pretty interesting because I had never, I had never used one before, and I'm, I was like, oh, this is, you know, such crap, you yeah, know. Yeah. Or, but, or uh, it's or it's bad juju. Or yeah, <laughs> but you know, everything's energy, and um, I've had some instances in my past where um, I've accidentally channeled people. Mm -hmm. not on purpose you know mm -hmm. it was just one of those things yep. and um you know it, it it's funny how that stuff you know it opens some doors that you didn't think were possible um we are so limited as human beings in comprehension that i mean we have to we have to really step back and say you know we're not any better than an ant or a bird or a fish or anything like that and when I was a little kid, I believed we were the who's and who'sville on the dust suspect in Horton, here's a who. Mm -hmm. and I always said, you know, we're probably some six alien, sixth grade science experiment, you know, and we're just this tiny dust suspect in their world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, all right. So we, like I said, we probably could have, could go on for another four hours, but we don't have time to do that. Um, but I really want to get into this process with you and give, give everybody a chance to see one of the things that you, that you do when you work with people. And then we'll, we'll kind of, I'll give an, like I said, I'll give it whatever experience I got from it. And then we'll close out, you know, from that and um, call, call it a day of uh, going out there and having, taking responsibility for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, we can do, we can do a quick map. Okay. So I want you to go ahead and um, just relax. And I want you to think about something that you really want to um, either understand at a deeper level or get rid of, or just a different thing that you really want to get rid of. And once you have that in your mind, just nod your head. Is it okay to share so people know? Or sure, you can share. Yeah, okay. Um, and I kind of know that I can't get rid of it, but it's still something that, that I see all, that I feel a lot of is fear. Okay, so what I want you to do, we're going to do a map. So I want you to think that you and I are going on 
a um, trip. And we need just a surface map of where we wanna go. It can be roads, it can be anything like that. So I want you to just go ahead and think about maybe a situation that was very fearful for you that you can easily bring up. Well, I mean, the last one that I could easily bring up was uh, I did a, a poetry <laughs> a poetry reading um, this weekend, over the weekend, standing in front of people reading a very vulnerable poem. <laughs> okay, so let's focus on that. Okay. And now I want you to go ahead and take some nice deep breaths. And we're going to go on this journey together. And I want you to think about, we need to mark the map where you are at right now. And I want you to pick something that is very familiar to you and very identifiable to you that you want to mark the, the map with your starting position. When you say identifiable, what do you mean? An experience or a location? Something, no, something easy that you can remember. As an, can you give me an example? Um, I identified a map with my office space. Okay. okay. So it could be anything. It could be your favorite pair of shoes. It could be, you know, anything that you want to mark the map with. It could be even a location that you already know that's very familiar to you. It doesn't matter. There is no right or wrong. Okay. All right. I was just trying to, okay. So, um, well, I have a bear that's a teddy bear that's been with me my whole life. Okay, so describe the teddy bear to me. So he, who doesn't have a name, <laughs> is probably about this this tall. Yeah. Sitting. And okay. brown with orange eyes. I'm looking at him right now. Okay. And little brown pads on his bottom of his feet and brown pads on the... Pause, okay. his, hand, his hands pause. <laughs> so you can easily identify him wherever you go for yes. your, your spot is, this is the home base. This is where your starting point is. Yes. Now, I want you to think about um, the poetry that you wrote and where do you see what you want? What, what would you rather happen when you, wrote, when you wrote that poetry? When I wrote it or when I read it? When you read your poetry and you had that fear, what would you rather ha see happen? In the, okay, so I wanted to feel confident. Okay. And I wanted to stop shaking. My whole body was shaking. Okay, so that's where you want to go to. Okay. That's your destination. Okay. Okay. So now I want you to go ahead and just take some nice deep breaths and relax. And imagine yourself next to your bear. And I want you to go ahead and start to float up like you were floating in air. And I want you to float up over the top. So you could see the horizon where your confidence and your mindfulness and everything that you wanted for your destination. And I want you to describe what you see in between your bear and that horizon that you wanna to get to. What objects are in the way? Are there, are there trees? Are there streams? Are there all sorts of different kinds of things in the way? Can it be an emotion or does it have it to can, be like a physical? It can be an emotion, sure. Okay. Well, there's, there's resistance. It's like a, a big spider web. I guess, like big enough to, to hold me back. Okay. Is there anything else in the way? 
Um, no, not really, because it's like really like I'm stuck. It feels like I'm okay. stuck in the spider web. So now I want you to go and imagine this big, huge spider web that's in between you and the horizon that you want to get to. Okay. And I want you to get a vivid picture of that spider web. Okay. Now, in your mind, I want you to go ahead and think of any type of tool you need to get through that spider web. What would you like to use to get rid of that spider web? My strength, my power. Like there's also a big spider there looking at me too. So that's not helping matters, but my strength and my power. Um, scissors would be cool. Cut scissors, yeah. okay. Yeah. But you've got that big spider looking at you. How are you gonna get rid of that big spider? That's why we're here. <laughs> Well, you could, you could use any kind of tool, anything in your imagination, you can use anything to get rid of it. If you want a blowtorch or you want a machine gun or you want a howitzer, there's, you can use anything you want to get rid of that. It's almost like I want to just use my me, like, like feeling my strength to just knock it out of the way and, and like, Move, okay. Move the web out of the way. Finally okay. being able to fight back, I guess. That's okay. So let's imagine that you're a superhero. Okay. And I want you to think of what your superhero powers are that you need to go ahead and squash that spider and annihilate that spider web. Do you want to be like Wonder Woman with magic bracelets or do you want to have some kind of magic wand or a magic lasso or what kind of superpowers do you want to take care of all of this spider web and the spider? I don't like the magic wand thing. Well, you pick. It's I like the know? magic wand, yeah. Magic wand? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now I want you to go ahead. Is there anything else that you need to take care of business with this spider web and this spider? I think, no, I think the magic wand will probably cover. Okay. The, and the incantation, so the incantation maybe. Okay, so now I want you to go ahead and imagine this magic wand. Mm -hmm. And I want you to describe this magic wand to me. Kind of like a Harry Potter wand, like the little thing, the little magical stick that's like this long. Okay. And like all I have to do is point it and the whole. And, okay. And just say some kind of something that rhymes, of course. <laughs> okay. And is there any certain color to this magic wand? Uh, it actually came out. I couldn't tell. It's either brown or black. Okay. And does it have any glitter to it? Or do you feel it vibrating in your hand? Does it, you feel any energy from it? I feel energy. Yeah, I feel energy from it. It's like. Okay. So what I want you to go, imagine that magic wand in your hand right now. Mm -hmm. And I want you to go ahead and I want you to feel and turn up the power on that magic wand. And give it all the force and the energy that it needs to go ahead and take care of the spider and the spider web. And when you're ready, you can annihilate the spider and the spider web. This is fun. <laughs> okay. God. So is there anything left that you see that might be in your path? No. 
Okay, so now I want you to go ahead to your destination where your confidence and all of those wonderful things are. And I want you to go ahead to that spot. And I want you to take a good look around you and see what's there in front of you. Describe what you see. Well, it's interesting because the spider in the web was like in the forest and it just feels like I walked through and out of the forest and all I see are millions of people's people's I mean, millions of people just looking at me and watching me and I and I'm not I don't want I don't feel like running I don't feel like hiding okay um, and do you feel uh, happy and what do you feel I'm feeling excited I'm feeling joy okay so I want you to go ahead and gather up everything that you see there. And I want you to go ahead and bring it back to your teddy bear. Hmm. And just nod your head when you're back to your teddy bear or just let me know. Okay, and now what I want you to do is I want you in your mind to turn around and look behind you and see if there is anything there. It's going to sound weird. No, it's not. Maybe. <laughs> like, it's like my ancestors are behind me and they're kind of giving me the go ahead. Um, but other than that, just them. Okay, Nothing so I, I want you to go ahead and I want you to turn around to your ancestors and say a blessing to them and to let them know that you appreciate their help and their guidance. And that, you know, that they're always going to be there for you to, to tap into at any time and ask them to go in peace. Are there any other ancestors left? Or are they gone? No, I don't see anybody. Okay, then you can open your eyes. How do you wow. feel? Like, I do this every single time I go through something. It's like, I feel this wave of just kind of, it's not dizzy. It's just like I'm sitting in this cocoon of energy. I don't know how to ever explain this. <laughs> That was good, I like that. Yeah, that was actually a technique that I learned in hypnosis class. Okay. You know, hypnosis can be um, various different ways. Um, you know, some people are afraid of hypnosis because they think that they're gonna lose um, control. And so when you have somebody that has anxiety, they think, oh my God, you know, these, this person is going to control me and I'm going to cluck like a chicken at the wrong time, you know, at a job interview or something like that. But yeah. the reality is you're always in charge. Yeah. And, and your brain knows exactly what it needs to do in order to heal itself. And even though it seems weird, like it's a spider on a spider web, your brain understands it. Your conscious mind may not what your subconscious does. Mm -hmm. And to add, you know, I mean, I have been in, uh, I've done hypnosis before also. I tried all kinds of things. So, and I've not done it with you yet. So I'm, I'm curious and interested at some point, but it's like, she, you're right. You don't, 
it's like being so, so relaxed. And there was, every time I did it, there was really nothing to fear. It's, it, that's, yeah. that's, that was the only time I ever felt, even with the anxiety that I had, it was the only time that I ever did not feel anxiety or fear. Mm -hmm. And I loved being in that state and having that yeah. support with me of somebody walking me through it. So it's not anything, you know, I mean, they, those stupid old movies that do get, get the guy there doing the crazy stuff and like with the chip, that's all crap. The pendulum, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Oh, wow. Thank you. That was good. That was good. All right. Well, I want to get something real quick. Um, I'll be, I'll be right back. You'll enjoy this one. And then I'll ask you that last question. All sure. right. This is all yeah. organic. So we do all kinds of fun things here. <laughs> sure. I'm not going to do it just yet, but uh, so um, was there anything else that you wanted to add to say to, you know, put out there in addition to what we talked about or um, I, I think that most people are a little concerned about the needles, mm -hmm. um, but the reality is the needles are very small and sometimes, um, people are reverting back to a childhood trauma. So I can do some tapping before a three minute tapping session before somebody has anxiety with the needles before I put the needles in. Mm -hmm. Or there are places on the body that the person won't even see them or feel them mm -hmm. or have very little sensation. But I would definitely try some, um, some things like, you know, hypnosis or acupuncture or things like that, especially if they don't have a diagnosis from a doctor or some, the doctor says, I don't know why you have this. Mm -hmm. um, to me, um, acupuncture has always been my first go-to. Um, because it's non-invasive. Uh, the Chinese herbs are very safe. Some of the Chinese herbs that we use, the formulas are 1800 years old. Um, and we've been using them for, you know, billions of people. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely uh, consider giving it a try before you go and spend your money um, with a Western medical doctor or somebody like that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately I see people at the end. I don't see them at the beginning. Um, and I've learned over the years that if you can, if you have a small problem, then there's probably a quick solution. But if you have a large problem, then we're looking at a long-term solution or no solution. So it's better, it's better when you start having problems to start to address them now and don't sweep them under the carpet. Mm -hmm. You know, ask your body, why am I having problems with things? You know, you know, it, in women, they always say we have 50 year old shoulders. Well, that's because women shoulder responsibility, a lot of responsibility and our shoulders give out. Mm -hmm. So ask your body, you know, if you're having trouble walking, ask yourself, well, why am I having a hard time moving forward in my life? Because walking is a forward motion mm -hmm. or why can't I shoulder something in my life? Ask yourself these questions and you can start seeing the emotional component to the disease you know, and that will help you correct what's going on. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's really, it's important. That's the thing is it's really important for you to talk to yourself. Sometimes like for me, sometimes I didn't get answers <laughs> initially, but I always got like some kind of something emotional that would come up. So I yeah. would end up going into that. Like if I'd start crying and I'd be like, oh, what's up? what's going on? Are you, you know, what's happening? Show me where, or like even like I started this day with a headache and when we're done, I'm going to go talk to my little girl and say, hey, why are we, why are you still holding on to this headache? You know that? Yeah. But yeah. I think it is, it's important to find that out. And definitely like I have also a friend of mine who has, who's got a hip issue going on and, and this stemmed after he had a knee surgery. And I know what's happening with him because I know his backstory. <laughs> and I'm like, 
um, have you considered going to get uh, acupuncture? Because he gave me this whole thing where they can't find anything. They did the MRI. They did this. They did that. There's nothing there. And he's like, yeah, that's my next move. <laughs> yeah, well, the knee is ego and the hip is uh, the root chakra. So that's childhood trauma issues. A hundred percent. Feeling yep. grounded. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the knee, wait a minute. The knee is ego ego mm -hmm. and the and the hip the hip is the root chakra so that's childhood trauma feeling mm -hmm. grounded yep. yeah childhood. bone is fear okay i'm sure he'll be happy to hear me tell him that <laughs> I'm sure he won't be all right so um for anyone who wants to look you up can you give us a link um, yes, uh, it's White Spire Center of Oriental Medicine. Um, okay. The book has its own website, The Silent Suicide. Um, and that is all, there's a TikTok page for The Silent Suicide. Okay. And I'll be posting all these links too. So yeah. 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 It'll, it'll be on YouTube and I think the other places anchor that they get posted. So uh -huh. you can find, you guys can find them there. Um, but all right, I think that should do it. And you, you ready for my little thing that I got? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, there's your friend. Hi. My confident, that's my confidence holder. He's been with me since I was six months old. And I've been oh, carrying goodness. him around. With, yeah, I mean, I've he's got everything. He takes all of my stuff from me. Uh-huh. So, and I've never named him because I, I don't know why, but I never did. So, huh. So he, here's, here's a wave from us and <laughs> I want to say thank you for yeah. being a part of this and Margo, yeah. thank you so much for sharing what you're doing. I'm really grateful to you and um, I think that's about it. So have a wonderful moment and take care from Caroline and the Ride of My Life podcast. <laughs>